Hi everyone, my name is Justin Gray and this is a lecture on taking derivatives of functions with vector valued inputs and outputs focused on implementation in OpenMDAO. By vector valued inputs and outputs, what we really mean is you have some function that returns a vector f and it takes a vector as its input x. So this could be of size l, the input, and the output could be of size m, which means that the partial derivatives that we care about, the partial derivative of f with respect to x, is going to be some kind of a matrix with entries in it. We don't know which entries, we'll figure that out in a bit. But we do know the size, and that has m rows and l columns. The example we're going to look at today is based on calculating the bending moment in a cantilevered beam. So you have a simple beam just like this. The fixed boundary condition on one side there. We'll consider two kinds of loading on that beam. There'll be some sort of a point load applied at an angle. We'll call that angle alpha. And that point load will be applied at some distance d from the wall. And then we'll also consider some sort of distributed load along the bottom doesn't have to be constant, can be any kind of arbitrary distribution that you want, but it's distributed along the length of the, of the beam. We will call the point load F, and we will call the distributed load Q of X, indicating a distributed load, because it's a function of X. A few other notes, the length of the beam be size L and we will consider a right hand positive. So what we want to do is calculate a moment at any point X along this beam. So maybe a point here or a point here or a point here. We need to define a variable to define that location. We'll call that X with zero starting here. And we want to compute whatever the value of x is, we want to compute the moment at that point. So there, or there, or there. To do that, we can write out the moment equations. We have to define it as a piecewise function. The distributed load part can be one continuous function, though. And we will do the moment at any point x is equal to negative the integral from x to l of the distributed load. And now I have to introduce a new distributed load uh, intermediate variable or integration variable. Z minus x, that accounts, so this is the integral of the loading force times the moment arm. The loading force times the moment arm. With respect to z. And then, what we need to do is also account for the point load. So just making a little room here. The point load is a piecewise function, so it's discontinuous, where it is f times the cosine of alpha, where f is the magnitude of the point load, times d minus x. Again, where d is the distance along the beam where the point load is being applied. And x is wherever this happens to be. So if x is here and here's d, then this is d minus x. And we need to multiply that by the moment arm. So d minus x, the magnitude of the force, that gives us a moment. Or it's 0. And it's 0 if x is greater than d, and this is if x is less than or equal to d. So that gives us the equation for our integration. OK, starting out here, I've pre-written the analysis, the OpenMDO component that matches the theory you see on the right over here. So this chunk of code right here inside this double for loop is the analysis itself. Here's the I.O. declaration. You can see we have some inputs, the distributed load input, the point load input, the angle of the point load, and the length of the beam.
We have two outputs, the bending moment measured at each point along the beam. So that's an array of bending moments there. And then the length of the beam itself, or the locations of these nodes essentially as a function of the length input. This calculation matches the distributed load and this calculation computes the bending moment from the point load. Now, we'll look at the run script, which is down here. You can see that we can run the model, but not much else is going on right now. So the very first thing I'm going to do is add a call to check partials. And I'll add the compact print argument equals true, just to keep the print to be small. And we can run this. And you can see that we did check the partials and all of them are wrong. We got some NANs and most of them are hugely violating, 100% violating the, the tolerance. That's to be expected though, because although we did do some partial declarations here, which tells OpenMDO what depends on what, we didn't actually define the derivatives. So now we can add a compute partials function that takes inputs and the partial derivatives themselves. And we're gonna need most of this stuff, so we'll just copy it. However, we don't have any of the outputs. Outputs are not passed in as an argument to compute partials, because for a number of reasons that we're not gonna get into, they're not actually safe to use inside this function. So we'll just get rid of the reference to the outputs and make sure that everything works. Okay, so we can run, but once again, the derivatives are still wrong. Now, one thing I wanna point out here is, this check is being done using finite differences. And we can see that more clearly if I turn off compact print. So just looking at any one particular print, we'll look at this one in particular, you see that we're using a forward mode finite difference to do this check. Finite difference is fine, but it would be nice if we could have things be a little bit more accurate. So we're going to turn on complex step, and I'm going to turn on the method to be complex step. And now you can see when we rerun this, it says complex step over here. So now we know we're checking the partial derivatives using complex step. So let's first take a look at one of the trickier derivatives. Uh, we'll look at the derivative of m with respect to l. That's the one of the more interesting ones. But before we do that, it's probably best to look at x with respect to l. So the derivative of x with respect to l is actually quite simple. It ends up just being x norm, right? Take this expression, differentiate it with respect to L, and all you're left with is X norm. We do that one first because we'll need it to differentiate the to compute the derivative of M with respect to L, because if we look at that expression, we see that there's a lot of X in there. And so by the chain rule, we know that we'll end up needing that additional derivative. Now, the derivative structure, the, der the structure of the derivative code should really match as closely as possible the structure of your nonlinear code. And by that, I mean that like these for loops should per be preserved. You should expect to see them show up in your derivative code. I'm going to comment out the nonlinear code here just so that we all know what we're differentiating. And now what we can see here is that there's really two parts to this equation. There's the first part here, the first term, and the second term, and they're multiplied together. So if we break that up into the two terms, then we can use the product rule to make the derivative a little easier to compute. And by that I mean the derivative of the first term times the second plus the derivative of the second term times the first. So d, I'll comment this out, d term one dl times term two plus d, well, term one times d term two DL. So if we can figure out how to compute this, and then that will make the derivative simpler. So we will use that structure. J, M, respect to L, lowercase, 
And just like in our nonlinear code, since we're going through it in a for loop, so just like the nonlinear code, we're going to compute one term of the Jacobian at a time. Since L itself is a scalar and M is a vector, we can expect the derivative to be of size NQ by 1. And that 1 means that there's essentially one column. There are NQ rows, one row for each entry in the M array. And then we can see that we are looping over i n q times. And so this index makes sense. Also, just like the nonlinear code, I'm going to mirror this minus equals here. And now we need to take the derivative of term 1 with respect to L. We know that q is an input, so it doesn't change with respect to L at all. All that changes is x. And we know from up here that the derivative of x with respect to L is x norm. So what we can do is just copy this term, but change this to an x norm. And that will give us this part of the derivative. Now, just to make things a little easier to see, I'm going to do that. So that is this component right here. Now we need to do that. We multiply by term 2. But now we have another portion of the com of the calculation to do. We need term 1 times the other one times the other derivative. So now we just need this. And once again, we know that the derivative of x with respect to L is just x norm. Add some parentheses to avoid a syntax error. And now, just, oops, we can see what we get. I'm going to put compact print back to true, just to keep this as readable as possible. And what we can see here is that, in fact, x with respect to L derivative is not correct, and neither is the m with respect to L. So let's turn compact print off to get more information, and we can see what we got wrong. x with respect to L looks like is off by a certain factor. It's not obvious what that factor is, though. Ah, there's a mistake here. x norm was reassigned. Self dot x norm. Just to make it a little more easy to use, clear this up. And now what we can see is that this derivative is now correct. So we fixed this one. And it's important that we fix this one because we knew that that derivative was necessary or we were using similar math to compute the rest of these. So once we know that this one is correct, we can go back and look at this one. We see this one is still wrong. m with respect to l is still wrong. And why would m with respect to l still be incorrect? Well, if we look at the nonlinear code, we see that there's two parts to the calculation of m. There's the distributed part and the point load part. We've only differentiated the distributed load part. So one nice trick you can use in situations like this is to go ahead and comment out the nonlinear calculation that you haven't yet differentiated. Clear the terminal, rerun the check, and now you can see that the derivative of m with respect to l looks correct. This is a good thing. It means that this part of the derivative is correct, and we just need to handle the second part now. So just like before, we will comment out the part of the derivative we're not looking at, and the same thing here in the partials. And we will look to compute the derivative of this next part, m, still doing m with respect to l. And just like before, we want to make sure that we only operate on the ith element. And now we, just like before, want to match this calculation here. We will grab this calculation, put it in. We, again, we know f is an input. We know alpha is an input. So these do not depend on l at all. All we have to do is differentiate the x terms. We know derivative of x with respect to l is, we just replace xk with this, is x norm. And the same thing here, x norm. And so now we can take a look at the calculations. We see that idxf is not defined. That's because this needs to be a capital. 
All right. So we see that we once again have the derivative of m with respect to l looking OK. That means we have this component of the derivative working. And so now we can uncomment them together. And this is a nice trick for working with multi-part derivatives like this. You can differentiate one part and then the other. They get added on top of each other. You see this one is a minus equals. This one is a plus equals. This is a perfectly valid and, in fact, a very effective way to handle derivatives when you have multi-step calculations, to break up the derivative calculation itself into the same kind of steps that you would do in the nonlinear calculation. We have one more error, line 52. Just because I didn't uncomment correctly. And now you can see that this derivative is correct and this derivative is correct. So we have correctly differentiated everything with respect to L. We can turn the compact print back on and run this again. You see this derivative has zero error and this derivative has zero error. Now at this point, I just want to take a moment to make one side note. Uh, to get the complex step derivatives checking for checking partials, I had to do two things. I had to turn on complex allocation, and I had to set the method to CS. If I had forgotten this, so for example, if I had forgotten to add this argument, when I run this code, you would see this warning right here, which says, hey, we weren't able to run with complex step. And so now you see that there actually is some small very small, but small error in the derivative calculations. That error is to be expected because it's not actually using complex step. It is using finite differences. And if I turn the complex allocation back on, clear the terminal and rerun, you see that error goes back to zero. In almost all cases, if you're using complex step partial derivative checking, you should expect the error to be either zero or very, very tiny, like 1e minus 12 or 14, something like that. So you can see that we, uh, we have this derivative correct, this derivative correct, these derivatives don't exist, x doesn't depend on f, q, or alpha, so we won't worry about those. So that just leaves us with these derivatives, m with respect to f, m with respect to q, and m with respect to alpha. Let's look at f and alpha first. Those are the simpler ones. Just as a reminder, f and alpha are both scalar inputs, so the derivative is of size n, q by 1. And we know that f and alpha don't affect this part of the derivative, the distributed load part. They don't come into that calculation. They only affect the point load calculation. So we can expect that they will only show up here in this part of the derivative, which reflects the point load calculation. So we'll go ahead and put those in. Uh, we'll look at f first. That one's a little simpler. Here's the nonlinear calculation right here. And so just like before, we're going to mimic that plus equals, which comes from the nonlinear calculation. Here's the actual nonlinear calculation, but we are differentiating with respect to f, which means the f goes away. So now we can run that and see how we did. And you can see that, in fact, the derivative with respect to f is now very accurate. Now, it's not exactly zero. Like I said, with complex step, you can expect it to either be zero or some very tiny number, but e to the minus 16 is, is more than good enough, so we're good there. Now, all that's left is to differentiate with respect to alpha. That's very slightly more complicated. Obviously, the x terms don't depend on alpha at all. We need the same plus equals as before. f is another input. It doesn't depend on alpha, so we just need to differentiate this term with respect to alpha. Turns out the derivative of cosine is just minus sine. And so now we can run this and just clear the terminal to make it a little easier to see. And you can see that we've got the correct answer here. So m with respect to l, m with respect to f, m with respect to alpha, all correct. And x with respect to l, still correct. So now we want to differentiate with respect to q. Looking at the nonlinear calculation, we see that Q only comes into effect into the into account in the distributed load calculation. So we don't have to worry about this part at all, only this part, which means we're working here. We want to compute J, M, with respect to Q. However, unlike 
L, if we go back and look at the shapes here, the derivative of M with respect to Q is actually NQ by NQ, so it's a matrix. And that's because Q itself is a vector. So now you're taking the derivative of a vector with respect to a vector, so you get a matrix. That means that because this is a matrix, we're gonna to have to handle these derivatives very slightly differently. And also, if you look at the nonlinear calculation, you notice that there's a QJ term and a QJ plus one term, which means that when we take the derivative here, we don't have a single index to deal with, but we have a second one as well. And we need to differentiate separately with respect to QJ and QJ plus one. So if we look here, if we're looking at this term, we're taking the derivative with respect to qj. And if we're looking at this term, we're taking the derivative with respect to qj plus 1. Just like before, we're going to mimic the nonlinear code structure. And just like before, we can use the product rule. Except now, it's going to be, instead of l, qj. And instead of qj, qj plus 1. Okay. Now we know that q is an input, which means that these x terms have no dependence on it. So when we differentiate term 1 with respect to qj, we can start here, just copy paste. Okay, so the only term that is affected by qj is this part right here, which means this entire thing will drop away means the whole summation drops away there. And obviously, since we're differentiating with respect to qj, that's what we're left with. So that gives you this term, right? And then you need to multiply by term 2. And then you need to look at the derivative of term 2 with respect to qj. But that one turns out to be 0, right? So that means this whole second part of the summation goes away. Then we need to do something similar, but now instead of qj, it's qj plus 1. Just like before, the derivative of term 2 with respect to qj plus 1 is 0, so this will go away. And we can grab this part of the calculation, take a look at it carefully, because again, this part has no dependence on qj plus 1. And we take that derivative, the qj plus 1 term goes away. And again, we have to multiply by term 2. So let's take a look and see how we did. Pretty good. We've gotten all of our derivatives to match now. So this one's 0. x with respect to l is 0. m with respect to l, m with respect to alpha, m with respect to q, and m with respect to f all look very, very good. The worst one is this one, which is basically 0 within floating point error. So that gives us the set of derivatives. We did define them using a dense partial, and let me explain exactly what that means. If I set compact print back to false so we can get slightly more information, remember that the derivative here is nq by nq. It's a matrix. So unlike these partials, where you're taking the derivative of a vector, like m with respect to a scalar l, which gives you a vector derivative, the derivative for m with respect to q is actually a matrix. And here we can see that it's an upper triangular matrix. Now, see that the accuracy we get is very good, but this is something that you should learn to do. You should always look at, for more complex partial derivatives, the structure, because sometimes you might have the right values, but maybe they're in the wrong place. You could be off by one on an index or something like this. So just to emphasize uh, the importance of looking at this, let's change nq from 3 to 6 very quickly. So now we'll have a 6 element array. You see that all of these guys got longer. They're now length 6 arrays. And this got much larger. And the upper triangular matrix st structure of the matrix is still there. But it's comforting to know that even when I change nq, my derivatives still match, although they're not no longer 0. But they're still very, very small, e to the minus 15, e to the minus 16. So we'll say that that's more than good enough and that these are complex step verified partial derivatives. Set that back to three. One more time, run it, and we're back to where we were before. So that is how you compute the derivatives of this component.
you can see how there's obviously a bit more code in the derivative, but the overall structure of the code, particularly the for loops that you have, match up one-to-one -one between the nonlinear code and the linear code here. And you can see how I differentiated in multiple parts, making the calculations of the derivatives sum into each other the same way that we did in the nonlinear code. All right. Now we've specified all the partial derivatives using a dense format, but if we take a look at the actual partial derivatives here, we can see that there is some sparsity, particularly m with respect to q, we can see is upper triangular. And we can make this a little bit more apparent by say making nq equal to five, and then looking at the derivatives. And this is a useful trick for whenever you wanna do sparse partials is to actually look at the check partials to get the actual structure here. So now we can see the sparsity pattern really starting to show up. And more importantly, or perhaps just as importantly, is we can see that there's also a sparsity pattern here in terms of m with respect to f. And the same thing shows up in m with respect to alpha. And if we set this to, say, 10, it'll get even more uh, apparent. So now we can see there's a real sparsity pattern here. Now, why are there only two entries here? it's because the default idxf value is 2. And so if I set idxf equal to, say, 5, we would see a slightly different pattern show up. So here we can see that idxf now extends this far. But the sparsity pattern here is still upper triangular. No change has really been made there. It doesn't matter what happens with IDXF in terms of the sparsity pattern for M with respect to Q. So why would we want to do sparse partials? Well, OpenMDAO, when you're specifying your derivatives using this format where you take advantage of the data structure that's given to you and compute partials, will, if you use dense partials, will allocate memory for this entire matrix. But we know about all these zeros, and we know they'll always be zero. So if you use a sparse partial, you can tell OpenMDO not to allocate the memory for all of these. So that's more memory efficient, but it also lets you use sparse linear algebra solvers, which are more com compute efficient. So there's some real computational performance to be gained from using sparse partials for problems like this. So we'll set IDXF back to 3. We'll, take it, we'll keep this value at 6 for the moment. Let's take a look at doing sparsity for the easy ones first. M with respect to F and M with respect to alpha. These two, these two are pretty easy. They have the same sparsity pattern. It just becomes zero once you get above IDXF. And we can see that because of this if condition here or this if condition here in the compute function. Basically, even though we're looping over I from zero to NQ, which would get you over this entire, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, since nq is 6 right now, but because of this if condition, the point load effects stop when i becomes greater than idxf. So the one thing we have to do first is we have to change this a little bit because now uh, the structure for l is going to be a little different than the structure for f and alpha because we're no longer using dense partials. And you'll see we can look at that right here, but if we look at the derivative of x with respect to l, we see that it's dense. And if we look at the derivative of m with respect to l, we see that it's mostly dense with the exception of this last one, zero here, but that's dense enough. And so we'll leave these two as dense. We won't bother specifying them as sparse. But now we do want to specify these guys as sparse. And to do sparse partials, what you need to do is add rows and calls as arguments to your declaration. And then you have to figure out what the rows and calls are. Now, let's take a look here just at, at this one, m with respect to f. We're talking about the rows and calls of the entries in the Jacobian. Now, in our case, we know that the calls are all gonna be zero because there is only one. So essentially what we wanna do is tell it exactly what the non-zero entries in this matrix are, or in this case, this you know column vector. So it's zero, zero, because that's this entry, and then one zero, two zero, and as you'll see, three zero is also important. And so we have to do that just like this. And this is pretty standard sparse formatting using COO formatting. 
However, I don't want to hard code these rows and calls like this. This I want them to be generic and a function of both NQ and IDXF. So let me grab IDXF out of the options. And these you can see, this is literally just a, an a, a range, like numpy a range. So we can say rows equals numpy dot a range of IDX F, but it's not just IDX F because the default value is two, or in our case, we've set it to three, but obviously we need to go all the way to three in the way that NumPy works. It's non-inclusive at the end, so we need to add one there. And then calls is not a range anymore, but zeros. So now we can set this to rows and this to calls. And we can take a look and see if we've got it right. And it looks like we do. Here are the rows and here are the two Jacobians. This is the analytic one. This is the finite difference, or in our case, complex stepped one. And everything seems to work out. So in this case, it was really as simple as setting the rows and calls up. Now, I got away with that in this case because of the specifics of how we were looping over things. Our outer loop goes from zero to NQ, so it does loop over every row, but there's an if condition here which stops and only triggers when I is less than or equal to IDXF, so it'll only trigger on zero, one, two, and three in this case. And that's how we get away with that. And you can see that we're setting the ith entry. Let's take a look at the more complicated one now. MQ. This one is certainly much more tricky. First of all, if we set this back to just two, not that it really matters because the derivatives here don't depend on IDXF, and we go back to three just to make the matrices a little smaller, what we can see is that we have 0, 1, 2, or 1, 2, 3 non-zero entries. But again, because of the way we've chosen to loop over things, we actually do need to include this diagonal. So we have zero, or one, two, three, four, five, and six non-zero entries. And that means if we just take a look at the indices, when i equals zero, j is gonna equal zero and one. When i equals one, j is gonna equal one only. Because remember, we only loop from i to nq minus one. So in this case, nq is three. So we only loop till two and it's not inclusive at the end, so zero, one. And then when i is two, we don't loop through j at all. So we need to convert these values into our four non-zero entries. One, two, three, four, five, six, six non-zero entries. We need to convert these locations in the for loop into all of these entries in the matrix. So we need to make sure we hit all of these index indices or locations. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. We need to hit all of those indices during these for loops. So that means when i is 0, j is 0, 1, we need to hit 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. Now if we flip back to our for loop, you can see that we actually do hit both the j and the j plus one th entries of the compute inside this loop, which is why we have to end the loop at nq minus one. So there is a way to make sure we do this, but we have to be very careful about how we handle it. Now, we have two challenges. First is we need to map the indices in our array, for example, these coordinates, into flat indices for when we specify the data because this is going to be zero, this is going to be one, and this is going to be two. Similarly, this needs to be looped to one, one, and one, two, which are going to map to three and four in the flat indices. And then this guy needs to go to two, two, which will map to five in the flat indices. So we need to handle all of this mapping and all of this indexing. And we need to do it in both the way we specify row calls and the way we access those entries 
here because we're not going to be able to use this indexing anymore. Now, I'm going to skip over the exact way that I figured this out. It's always a little tricky to figure out the indices. Now, for the rows and calls, it's actually not that hard. Uh, we can, again, just follow our looping structure. So we'll make rows, we'll make calls, and then we'll say for i in range and q, and then for j in range i to and q rows dot append i calls dot append j and that should give us everything we need. So now we can say rows equals rows and calls equals calls. So we specified the rows and calls, and you can check for yourself, but this will work out. However, if we run this, we're going to get an error now. We're going to get too many indices for array. And that's because when you use sparse partials, sparse partials, you don't get a 2D matrix anymore. You get a flat array. And so we somehow need to convert these guys into their flat equivalents. Now the math for that turns out to be a little bit tricky. I'm going to let you Google it. But essentially what you can do is you can compute an offset for each row. And that's going to equal i times i plus 1 integer divided by 2. And then we can compute this flat index by doing n q times i plus j minus the offset. And that will give us k. And then this guy is just k plus 1, because it's the j plus 1 index. And now, if we run this, we no longer get an error, and we can see that we actually do get the right derivatives. So here, these two lines allow me to convert from the two-dimensional indices to a flat index. And now, just to prove that it works, we can set this up to be larger again. And we can see that even in a 6 by 6, we get the right answer. But we've saved ourselves the allocation, memory allocation of this entire lower triangular matrix. Now, may not seem like a big deal now, but obviously if we made this very large, something like 100, you'd be saving substantial amounts of memory. And when you start to add that up over all of the components across all of your models, you actually do start to get a substantial savings at the Jacobian level of the entire model. So sparse partials are absolutely worth your effort and worth your time to set up. And I hope that this tutorial has made them a little bit less obtuse for you.